Good evening, everyone. We'll be starting in just a moment. We're letting everyone cycle into the room. Thank you so much for logging in. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Melissa Figueroa. I'm the Director for Communications and Public Affairs for CANP, and it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. You have joined the California Association for Nurse Practitioners webinar, What It Means for NPs, a webinar on SB 1451. Some housekeeping items before we begin this evening. This webinar is not open to the press and may not be duplicated or published without written permission of CANP. The webinar is being recorded. All attendees' cameras and microphones are muted and will remain so throughout the presentation. Questions that were submitted electronically in advance will be addressed near the end of the presentation, thanks to those of you who submitted questions. And a recording of this presentation will be available on the CANP website tomorrow. October 8th. It's my pleasure now to introduce Amy Paulson, the president of CANP. Thank you so much, Amy. Amy, you can go ahead and begin now. Thank you. Hello and welcome to CANP's webinar on SB 1451. We're thrilled that over 900 nurse practitioners have joined us tonight for this important presentation. Senate Bill 1451, which was supported by CANP, was signed into law by Governor Newsom on September 22nd and will take effect on January 1st, 2025. Tonight, we have an amazing panel of experts to talk with you about all of the details and what it means for your future, for your current and future practice. I also want to thank those of you that submitted questions. We'll answer them near the end of the presentation, and then we'll make the presentation available to members shortly. In addition to this, we will be releasing our fourth FAQ pertaining to SB 1451 and AB, 18, or AB 890 implementation. Now I would like to introduce our panelists. First is Garrett Chan, CEO of Health Impact, an adjunct professor at UCSF. Garrett is a nationally recognized health policy expert and serves as an advisor to CANP. Cynthia Jovanov was our most recent president of CANP and now serves as immediate past president. Cynthia is especially knowledgeable about navigating the business side of legislation and helped guide the association during some of the most critical stages of SB 1451. Christy Wees is CANP's longtime legislative advocate and a partner at Capital Advocacy, where she leads their healthcare practice division. Christy is one of the most highly respected healthcare advocates in California and has provided steady leadership to CANP for nearly two decades. She's been instrumental in recent legislative and regulatory accomplishments. And I'm Amy Paulson. I began my term as CANP president on July 1st of this year, and I'm thrilled to moderate this webinar tonight. Before we begin, I do need to share a legal notice with you. So the content of this presentation is being provided for general informative purposes only and is not legal advice or a substitute for legal counsel. Given that employment and medical services performed by MPs can vary greatly from practice to practice, each participant should contact their attorney to obtain legal advice tailored to their specific circumstances. So we've opened this webinar up to all nurse practitioners in California, not just our members. And we did this as a means to help those that are not currently members learn about this recent legislation, as well as learn about CANP. So it's important to note that CANP is the only nurse practitioner association in California. We're the only organization fighting for you every day to promote legislation that protects your practice, 
to better serve your patients. Our one mission is to serve as the unifying voice for our profession and provide a networking forum for nurse practitioners, providing expert guidance and advancing the profession statewide. We've been representing California's nurse practitioners for nearly 50 years, and we have more than 3,000 members. While CANP has been advocating for nurse practitioners since 1977, we've more recently had significant legislative victories, including AB 890, authored by Assemblyman Jim Wood, which was signed into law by Governor Newsom in 2020, which allowed nurse practitioners a pathway to practice without physician supervision. And of course, SB 1451, which was signed into law last month. But these were not our first uh, accomplishments in terms of advocating for our profession. This can go back even earlier than 2013 when we achieved the ability to allow nurse practitioners So actually, I think the year was, if we could back up one slide, that would be great because I can't see it. There we go. So in 2013, we gained the ability for nurse practitioners and PAs to supervise medical assistants in all settings. 2017 allowed for nurse practitioners and PAs to have authority to prescribe opiates for addiction management. You can see in 2019, one but not the only uh, accomplishments again that we've had over the past, you know, many years, authorized NPs to certify the needs of an individual diagnosed as deaf or hard of hearing. And again, skipping ahead to the most recent legislation, AB 890, and now the follow-up to that to help fulfill implementation is SB 1451. So now moving back ahead, uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about what you get you know, from being a CANP member. And the three things that I'll highlight tonight are advocacy, community, and opportunity. Our legislative and regulatory leadership impacts your practice. With community, we provide a network to learn from other NPs through chapters and webinars like this. And the opportunity really comes from what you put into it. And I can speak from personal experience. I've given a lot to the organization in terms of being a chapter leader and being on the state board, but what I've received in return has been so much more. So if you're not currently a member of CAMP, I'm hoping that you're thinking about it and I'm going to ask that you get your phones out. We're offering a discount tonight to all of those that join. And so you can scan this QR code with your phone or go to the CAMP membership page and enter the promo code NPJOIN which will give you $25 off membership until October 31st. So keep your phones out because there's one more item I want to mention that you don't want to miss, our annual conference, which continues to grow. It's an amazing opportunity to meet and learn from other nurse practitioners. Nearly 700 attended our last conference, which makes it the largest gathering of MPs on the West Coast. You'll have the opportunity to earn over 20 CEs and at least six pharmacology credits while enjoying the beautiful Rancho Mirage location that our conference will be placed. So scan this QR code if you want to join me, our panelists, Christy, Cynthia, Garrett, and hundreds of others. And you can sign up now for the early bird discount rate by taking a picture of the QR code. And finally, we should start our presentation with our panel of experts. I'm going to first turn to CMP's legislative advocate, Christy Weiss. Well, good evening. Um, thank you all for joining us, and I really appreciate the opportunity to participate tonight um, and share a little bit about the journey that CMP went through, um, kind of on the inside around SB 1451 and what its passage means for nurse practitioners. So as many of you know, and as Amy highlighted uh, in her presentation, um, CANP was successful in securing the passage of Assembly Bill 890 by Assemblymember Jim Wood, which was the product of many, many years of legislative and ad advocacy and work and was signed into law by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2020. Since that time, the Board of Registered Nursing has been engaged in a number of rulemaking and regulatory procedures, 
which will further the implementation of the law. First, the legislature had to pass the law, and then we had to work through the process with the Board of Registered Nursing, um, ensuring that the provisions that allow nurse practitioners to work without physician supervision were in place. Since 2020, CAMP has been working with the board and has identified a number of places um, in the law created by AB 890 that needed clarification. Some of those provisions came from the members of CAMP who raised those issues through the association. Others came from conversations with the BRN, and it was clear that there needed to be statutory clarifications which is not uncommon for a bill with the complexity that AB 890 has and with such a significant policy change that AB 890 established. CAMP spent over a year identifying what the provisions were that needed clarification, talking to key stakeholders, drafting language, and going through the process of talking to members of the legislature to find an author who would take this issue on and move it through the legislative process. We were very fortunate that Senator Angelique Ashby, who's our Senator here in Sacramento and who is the chair of the Senate Business and Professions and Economic Development Committee was was willing to take this on, understood the issue, has been a tremendous supporter of nurse practitioners and really understands the way that NPs expand access to healthcare and, and the goals and objectives of 890. And so she was willing to take on the leadership role and carry these changes through the legislature. One thing that's a little bit different about SB 1451 is that it is not a bill that reopened, relitigated, or re-debated, uh, frankly, the policy question that um, was put forward in AB 890. And for those of you who've been watching these issues for a long time, you probably know how contentious the AB 890 debate was moving through the legislature. But what we came to Senator Ashby this year and said, actually it was you know, the begin end of last year, is we said, look, AB 890 is the law of the land. The legislature passed it on a bipartisan vote. The governor signed it. We are not reopening that policy question. Instead, what we need to do is we need to make these fixes and clarifications to the statute to ensure that it can be successfully implemented in the way that was intended. Because of that, those of you who've looked at the bill, you may have noticed that that language is in SB 1451 with many other provisions, provisions that relate to dental hygienists, you know, other, um, other licensed professions, along with the changes to the Nursing Practice Act. The bill is a cleanup bill, and, it, and it, the, the framework of that bill is rather than a new policy bill like 890, in fact, this is a bill that really is focused on implementation. And so I know CNPs received um, many questions kind of throughout the year about why is there all this stuff in this bill? And, and so we wanted to just kind of share a little bit of the framing. In spite of that, the SB 1451 continued to face opposition from organized medicine, uh, most notably the California Medical Association throughout the legislative process you know, even up to the governor's desk. And so um, we share that just as a kind of bit of framing that unfortunately, here we are in 2024, almost 2025, and even um, efforts that we make to kind of clarify the law, the doctors oppose those as well. So recognizing the complexity of AB 890 and the complexity of SB 1451, um, we're grateful to have this time to answer a lot of your questions. And with that, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Garrett Chan. Great, Christy. Before you go, I'm just uh, wondering if you could talk about uh, the coalition that was built um, around 1451. Yep, definitely. Um, one of the, thank you for that. 
Um, one of the really tremendous kind of, I think, leadership roles that CAMP has played in recent years is to work on leading and organizing um, a very large coalition. We refer to it, it's actually has a name, the Close the Provider Gap Coalition. And it was formed through AB 890 through that time period and also continued to engage with the legislature through the SB 1451 debate and is a very large coalition of all sorts of healthcare providers, healthcare facilities, hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, um, folks that organize labor, our partners at SEIU, and many, many, many other organizations who want to see nurse practitioners, you know, practice to the full extent of their education and training um, and expand access. And so that has been a, a great um, component of this debate and discussion as well. And um, always encourage folks to join that coalition. If there's some, if you're on this webinar and you know of an organization that should be connected, um, please do let us know, and, and we're happy to um, connect you with that because it is a, it's a great resource. Great, thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. So so I get to talk about the amendments that are were secured through Senate Bill 1451. And um, what I wanna share first of all is that there are some things that are really outside the scope of uh, this webinar and 1451. And I just wanna make mention of it because I know that some of the questions came uh, forward that had uh, that questioned uh, the concepts of uh, the 104 NP pathway. Um, the reason why it's outside the scope of this bill is because um, it, it hasn't changed since AB 890. Um, the Board of Registered Nursing is still working on implementation of 104 NPs. Um, so any kind of question around 104 NPs is really outside the scope of this webinar. The other uh, group of questions that we received um, prior to the webinar was about nurse practitioners creating corporation. And this is really a complex area of law. And I just want to give a shout out to Melanie Balestra and Nick Webb, um, who are attorneys um, and uh, nurses and nurse practitioners, um, really expert in this area. Um, definitely uh, Melanie Balestra, B-A-L-E-S-T-R-A, -E and Nick Webb. Um, I would strongly encourage um, anybody who's interested in um, Thinking about creating an MP corporation, please contact them. Um, I have no conflict of interest. That I don't get any money from them. So, but they're just amazing um, human beings and um, really experts. So, please reach out to them. But it is really outside the scope of this webinar. Uh, one of the other things that uh, came in as Christy. Um, mentioned is that Senate Bill 1451 was a cleanup bill for multiple um, professions, not just the health professions, but um, one of the professions that was included in Senate Bill 1451 was uh, a provision or a section of the bill to look at the Medical Practice Act and the clarification of the title doctor and the abbreviation of DR. Um, the bill 1451 um, opened up uh, Business and Professions Code 2054, which is in the Medicine Practice Act. That statute does not belong, or th there's no oversight of the Nurse Practice Act in um, Section 2054. And really, the amendments were focusing on expanding the statutory authority to allow doctors of osteopathy um, to be able to use the titles of D, uh, doctor or the abbreviation DR, because prior to 1451, the language in uh, Business and Professions Code 2054 focused on MDs only. Um, I know that this is a hot topic and perhaps a, a topic to come to the uh, conference um, next year, because I think we're going to be talking about it. Um, but uh, I know that this is raise a lot of questions and issues for nurse practitioners really, um, but the bill 1451 really addressed only the Medicine Practice Act and not the Nurse Practice Act. Um, in the uh, latest round of amendments or one of the latest rounds of amendments that the author took, Senator Ashby, was um, a an amendment that allowed any healing art act that allows the use of 
the abbreviation DR or the title doctor, um, the statute um, in 2054 would really not restrict any other um, health profession that already has that authority in law to be able to use DR or doctor. And so unfortunately that doesn't apply to nursing. We have no statutes in the Nurse Practice Act to allow for the use of DR doctor. And that is something that we probably should uh, address in the future. Um, but other professions like occupational therapists, physical therapists, chiropractors, um, optometrists, they have in statute the authority to use the title doctor or the abbrevi abbreviation DR um, in, their stat in their practice acts. And that's um, why this amendment was accepted into um, 1451. Um, the other kind of amendment that was accepted was that uh, Senator Ashby added an additional um, statute um, that prohibited any individual who is not an MD or DO to claim that they practice medicine um, according to what I would call the truth in advertising law, which is Business and Professions Code 17500. Um, it, and so um, it just ties the truth in advertising law in California to this particular statute. Um, therefore, no one should pra pra uh, excuse me, no, sh no one should claim that they're practicing medicine um, if they are not a DO or an MD. So um, that's uh, the doctor thing where there's more work to be done here. Um, so let's go on to uh, the nurse practitioner provisions of AB 890. And because 1451 is so tied to AB 890, I thought it was going to be important for us to do a very brief um, and cursory review of AB 890 so that we're all kind of on the same page. Um, what was set out in um, AB 890, as Christy said, was the policy that people living in California should have increased access to care through nurse practitioner services. Um, without requiring physician supervision. Um, so that's the policy, increasing access to care to people living in California, or perhaps even visiting California, um, by nurse practitioners uh, without requiring um, physician supervision. In AB 890, it is a very complex law, so this is not a comprehensive review of AB 890, but some of the key important points to bring forward for our discussion in this webinar is that there were two new categories of nurse practitioners that were created um, as a result of the passage of AB 890. Now, what we already have are nurse practitioners who work um, under standardized procedures. So um, nurse practitioners can practice um, as nurse practitioners or any nurse RN for that matter can do something outside the scope of practice of nursing uh, so long as they have a standardized procedure in place. And there are statutes there and regulations by the Board of Registered Nursing that articulate the 11 elements that you must have to, ha to have a standardized procedure. AB 890 created these two new categories and what we call um, colloquially 103 NPs and 104 NPs because they refer to the various um, statute numbers that um, delineate who these NPs are. So Business and Professions Code 2837.103 are the 103 NPs and Business and Professions Code section 2837.104 are the 104 NPs. So let me go through the 103 NPs first. So um, kind of in general, when we think about um, a scope of practice, it's really a legal framework to tell us who can do what, under what circumstances, and be reimbursed for it. So who can do what, under what circumstances, and be reimbursed for it. And so if we think about that framework of a scope of practice or things that are legally authorized for nurse practitioners, it helps us understand um, the 103 and the 104 NPs. So the qu first question, who? Who can do this? Well, nurse practitioners can be, get a 103 certificate from the Board of Registered Nursing if they have completed a transition to practice program, or not a program, but a transition to practice period, of 4,600 hours, or having three full-time equivalent years in California. 
there's no requirement for a formal program. So by practicing um, for 4,600 hours or three full-time year, uh, equivalent years um, in California, that um, and there are some uh, criteria of what needs to happen in those three years or 4,600 hours, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, that that uh, helps you become qualified to apply to become a 103 NP through the Board of Registered Nursing. Um, the second requirement is that you must be recognized by the Board of Registered Nursing as a nurse practitioner. So um, in California, we don't have a lic an NP license. We have something called an NP certificate. The NP certificate is um, issued by the Board of Registered Nursing. Should you meet all of the minimum qualifications to be recognized by the Board of Registered Nursing um, to get the NP certificate. And the third component um, is that you must have, a 103 NP must have national NP certification. Um, you must have it and you must maintain it in order for you to become a 103 NP. If for some reason the national NP certification lapses, then you are immediately no longer a 103 NP because you must have the national NP certification in order for you to maintain that 103 NP certificate. So um, that's who, who can be a 103 NP. Um, under uh, who can do what, so we'll talk about the scope of practice, um, which is the kind of the third major bullet point. Um, uh, the scope of practice was established um, finally in, in law. Um, things like uh, being able to do an advanced assessment, um, things that you can um, order, prescribe, um, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic um, uh, therapies. Um, you can uh, prescribe, administer, dispense, and furnish pharmacologic agents, including over-the-counter legend and controlled substances. So there's a whole section within AB 890 that delineates what it is that we can do. So who can do what? The scope of practice is finally delineated for 103 and 104 NPs in AB 890. Under what circumstances? So um, here for 103 NPs, uh, 103 NPs um, must practice in one of six settings in which at least one MD or DO works. And there are some exceptions, but um, in general, the six settings include things like um, a clinic that's licensed by the California Department of Public Health, um, a health or hospital system, um, they uh, can, they need to be a, uh, they can be in a um, uh, correctional treatment center. Um, they can be in a state hospital. Um, they can be in a medical group practice. Um, so for instance, if you're um, with the Kaiser Permanente Medical Group or the Sutter Medical Group, that would be in a group medical practice, um, a home health agency, um, or a hospice facility. Um, so uh, those are the, the areas where um, 103 NPs can practice. So who can do what under what circumstances means, needs to be in one of the six settings um, and be reimbursed for it. So um, as a brief overview of 103 NPs, which is important because it launches into why we sought clarification and um, cleanup in 1451 is that there were lots of questions around um, the transition of practice. Uh, and um, so we're gonna talk about that in a few slides. Uh, the 104 NPs are um, NPs who have practiced for some time and I'll, this will become more clear in the next slide, but I'm just gonna go over it briefly here is that in order for somebody to become a 104 NP, they must have the same qualifications as a 103 NP. So they must have the transition of practice period. They must have to, they must be recognized by the BRN as being an NP. They must have national cert NP certification. 104 NPs, however, can practice outside of the six 103 NP settings. 
Um, this means that they can open up their shingle. They can hang out their own shingle and they can create their own um, business um, outside of the six uh, settings required for 103 NPs. Um, I'll say this here, and again, I will repeat it in the next slide, but um, in order for a 104 NP to become a 104 NP is after they get through their 103 certificate, they've done all the things that are required to become a 103, then they need to practice for three additional years as a 103 certificate holder, and then they can um, apply to become a 104 NP. Now, one of the things that we know in AB 890 is that no uh, 103 NP can become a 104 NP until at least January 1st, 2026. So we have some time um, before we can see the first 104 NPs um, in California. 104 NPs have the same scope of practice as 103 NPs. Again, they can do an advanced assessment. They can come up with a differential diagnosis list and a primary diagnosis or a list of diagnoses. Again, uh, plan therapeutic uh, regimens and treatment plans. Um, all the things that I mentioned earlier, 104 NPs can do the same. So this is a broad overview. There are other nuances to 103 and 104 that really are outside um, the scope of this webinar. Um, but I wanted to give you all kind of a, a foundation of why this was important, because now that you understand 103 and 104 in, in more depth, we're going to be talking about what were the amendments sought um, uh, that were cleaning up AB 890 that showed up in 1451. But um, if we go to the next slide, before we do this, I wanted to, some of us are visual learners, I'm a visual learner, so I wanted to make sure that you saw this kind of in a picture uh, diagram. So you, let's just say somebody graduates and passes their national certification and they get recognized by the BRN as being a nurse practitioner. Then what ends up needs to happen is that um, that person needs to will start their 4,600 hours or th three full-time years of transition to practice um, under standardized procedures. So you have to practice under standardized procedures during this um, TTP period. Once you finish all of those things, and we'll be talking about them a little bit more in de detail in the future slides, but once you finish um, the transition to practice, then you apply uh, to the BRN for your 103 certificate. After you receive your 103 NP certificate, it starts the clock. You practice for an additional three years. Um, there is a slight reduction for DNPs, NPs who are DNPs. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Let me just go through the graphic. Um, so once you do your three additional years as practicing with a 103 certificate, then you can apply to the BRN for your 104 NP certificate. So this is the step by approach. Now, some of you might be student NP students, and so this makes a lot of sense for uh, people who are ready to graduate or who are recently graduated. For nurse practitioners like me, who've been in practice continuously, for me, at least since 2006, um, so long as you have your 4,600 hours or three full-time years, um, uh, and I'll tell you in the time period of five years, um, we'll go more in depth in a future slide, but um, if you have your 4,600 hours or three full-time year, year equivalents in the past five years, you can now apply immediately to the Board of Registered Nursing for your 103 um, NP certificate. I mentioned that if you have a DNP, there is a provision in the statute um, that has now been clarified in regulation um, for DNPs. So DNP, if you're an NP DNP, any hours of direct patient care that you, the applicant, during the course of your doctoral education, so long as the direct patient care is both one, in the applicant's area of national certification, and two, provided during the doctoral part of the applicant's doctoral education, um, and are not credited towards the applicant's master's degree, it, should there be a master's component in your DNP program. So any um, clinic direct patient care hours that you do as a DNP um, student, um, DNP NP student, 
those hours can be subtracted from the three additional years that are required. Now, in some schools, we've done analyses. There are like some, something like 400 hours. Some schools have 600 hours. So whatever number of hours in direct patient care you do as a DNP, um, NP student, you can subtract those hours or number of hours from the three years um, that are required for you to become a 104 NP. Because we're not at the 104 NP stage yet, we'll have more information coming out um, as we get closer to January 1st, 2026 to help people navigate through this. On the next slide, um, I, this is a broad overview graphic and we're gonna go, uh, each one of these has a separate slide so that you can actually read it. But um, one of the important things to note is that um, CANP listened to both CANP members as well as nurse practitioners who are not yet CANP, CANP members about the challenges and confusion they experienced um, uh, in applying for 103 um, certificate, uh, certificate status by the BRN. And so um, the, this graphic shows uh, on the left-hand side, the clean, cleanup requests um, after AB 890 was enacted. And what were the amendments that were secured um, as a result of the passage of Senate Bill 1451? So I'm gonna take each one of these um, in each individual slide. So on the next slide, um, the uh, first one is, to amend the definition of transition of practice to allow greater flexibility for attestation and streamline the NP application process. So as, as we analyzed the, the challenges uh, that people were going through in the transition of practice uh, process, um, there were some clarifications that were um, obtained with the passage of Senate Bill 1451. Uh, it clar 1451 clarifies that the TTP attester need not specialize in the same category of the applicant that the eligible person is attesting and shall and the person who's attesting shall only attest to the completion of the transition of practice. So there's, those are two very important points. The first one is that the TTP attester need not specialize in the same category as the NP. This became a, a major issue um, in California. Uh, we had family nurse practitioners who were working with cardiologists for 20 years. And so there was confusion whether the cardiologist could sign off and attest to the transition of practice of the family nurse practitioner, even though this nurse practitioner had worked with this cardiologist for 20 years. And the cardiologist felt very comfortable and confident about um, the transition of practice, uh, meeting the transition of practice requirements. So there is not a easy or clear um, uh, line between in the nurse practitioner world, what we call population foci. There are six population foci, you know, family, adult gero, uh, pediatric, neonatal, psych mental health, and gender specific slash women's health. Those don't always and easily um, translate into medical specialties and medical subspecialties. So the question for pediatrics, well, we pediatrics may seem clear, like, oh, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, I can have my pediatric, you know, physician colleague can sign off, that is true, but what about pediatric neurology? Could a pediatric neurologist sign off on a pediatric nurse practitioner? And the answer now is yes, legally, there is no requirement that the um, attester specialize in the same category as the nurse practitioner. Um, and then the other important point here is that the person who's attesting shall only attest to the completion of the transition of practice. And we'll explain that more on the next slide. Um, can you... And the next slide is here, um, streamlining the ability for supervising physicians and surgeons and other nurse 103 and 104 NPs to attest to the completion of a transition of practice. So here, what we see in the securing of um, the cleanup language for um, AB 890 is that um, there is only a requirement to prove that you the nurse practitioner has done only one TTP to be provided to the Board of Registered Nursing. 
And it, the attestation can come from a physician and surgeon or a certified 103 NP or a certified 104 NP. So a physician or sur and surgeon, that's the title of their license. Uh, just like we have a license called registered nurse, their license is called physician and surgeon. So a licensed physician and surgeon or a certified 103 NP or a certified 104 NP by the Board of Registered Nursing can um, attest to sign off on the attestation um, of a 103 applicant. And again, in this language, it states that there's only requirement for one TTP. That's all you need. You don't need a TTP sign off if you're a fam if you're dually boarded, like you're a family nurse practitioner and a psych mental health nurse practitioner. You only need one TTP. Um, you don't need one TTP for your family and one for your psych mental health. On the next slide, um, we recognize that people had um, some concerns about their liability of attesting. So um, we wanted to ensure that physicians and surgeons and eligible nurse practitioners, again, 103 and 104 NPs who attest for a completion of transition to practice are not subject to any penalties or liabilities. And so the language in uh, 1451 specifies that an eligible person who attests to the completion of a transition of practice shall not be subject to civil, criminal, administrative, disciplinary, employment, credentialing, professional discipline, contractual liability, or medical staff action, sanction, or penalty, or other liability for providing an attestation or refusing to provide an attestation. So there is, other than if uh, an attester is fraudulently attesting to a 103 applicant uh, transition of practice, um, that would be cause for being liable. Um, but there are no other uh, criminal, civil, administrative, disciplinary, et cetera, um, ramifications for the person who's attesting. So of course, <laughs> we don't want people to fraudulently get um, somebody to attest uh, that they've completed the transition to practice. Um, and so this, um, this amendment to and clarification in the cleanup bill um, really wanted to clarify that because there were so, some con concerns by attesters like, well, what, what, how can I get into trouble? And so we wanted to clearly articulate that there really isn't other than fraud. You know, fraud is you know not encouraged at all and actively discouraged. Um, other than that, there is no other uh, penalty for the attester. On the next slide. Um, we wanted to, um, of course, listen to uh, the community, um, and we wanted to uh, remove any kind of spe specific language. Um, uh, so removing the requirement to use the Spanish phrase enfermera especializada um, was a key, a key request by um, people in the community. Uh, we took that to heart of course, um, and now the new language states that um, it requires the 103 or 104 NP to inform all new patients in a language understandable to the patient that the NP is not a physician and surgeon. So it's more general, it addresses all languages, um, and so uh, this was a win uh, for clarity and clarification um, so that you can use the appropriate title many uh, languages don't have an easy translation um, of nurse practitioner into their um, language, but what is required for any 104, when it, when any 103 or 104 NP is that you must inform all new patients in a language understandable to them uh, that the NP is not a physician and surgeon. On the next slide, um, we wanted to, this was a big thing because um, we weren't clear about the unintended consequences of some of the other language in AB 890. Um, we wanted to ensure that those nurse practitioners who had what we call legacy certifications can apply to become a 103 or 104 NP. 
And these are legacy certif national certifications are certifications that are still valid um, so long as the nurse practitioner uh, maintains their uh, renewal requirements of holding these um, certifications that have been sunset um, and have uh, morphed into um, our modern day or current uh, national certifications. So examples of legacy certifications include um, the adult nurse practitioner, the uh, gerontology nurse practitioner, the acute care nurse practitioner adult, um, the adult site mental health NP, and the pediatric site mental health NP. So um, the amendment that we were able to um, secure in 1451 is that um, it makes a provision requiring the assessment and alignment of competencies, in a, a, which is a requirement for all currently offered national certifications, is that there's an office within um, the state government that has to do this evaluation periodically of ensuring that the national certification is congruent with the scope of practice that was um, outlined in AB 890, um, that any um, NP national NP certification that was discontinued before January 1st, 2017, and those are the, nurse, uh, the NP certifications that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, um, are exempt from this requirement. Um, and so now any ANP, GNP, ACNP, adult psych mental health NP and pediatric psych mental health NP can now, well, um, uh, I'll say this, as of January 1, 2025, um, will be able to apply for 103 NP status so long as they meet all of the other requirements um, like the transition to practice, they have to be recognized by, by the Board of Registered Nursing, et cetera. You still have to meet all of the same requirements. And now the Board of Registered Nursing starting January 1, 2025, will be able to accept your application and do the review. And should you have no deficiencies in your application, you will be able to obtain the 103 NP certificate. On the next slide, um, we have um, clarification around the language um, requiring, uh, so there was a regulation that was promulgated or created um, by the Board of Registered Nursing um, in Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations, um, which is Section 1487, Subsection C, which required nurse practitioners to advise patients that they have a right to see a physician and surgeon on request and under the circum and the circumstance or circumstances under which they must be referred to see a physician and surgeon. And so um, in SNP Bill 1451, it clarifies that a 103 or a 104 is not required to tell a patient that uh, he or she or they have a right to see a physician and surgeon. So it explicitly states that 103 and 104 NPs are not required to advise a patient that they have a right to see a physician and surgeon. So um, on the next, uh, so this is the last of the amendments that were um, taken and passed through uh, to the governor's desk and it was signed in um, late September. Um, and so I'm going to pass it back to Amy to talk about what the next steps are. Oh, sorry, Cynthia. I'm going to pass it to Cynthia. <laughs> yes, Cynthia, please. And you're on mute, Cynthia. Thank you, Garrett, for the highlights of um, AB 890 and what we worked so hard to strive um, for SB 1451. So what are the next steps? Um, we encourage everyone to apply to be a 103. Now, many of you guys may feel like, well, I'm working at this institution, um, you know, um, I don't think a 103 is going to apply to me or I don't foresee myself as a 103. Well, I tell everybody, just apply. We don't know what the next few years will hold um, for yourself as a clinician, what your goals and your visions are. Um, and as we will continue to aggressively move forward with now planning for 104 legislation. So I tell everybody, apply, right? Um, it's always good to 
um, be prepared for the future. Um, second is, you know, if you're having any issues with applying to 103, um, we encourage everyone, we encourage everyone to notify CANP. Um, this is, we have some strategic, we have some um, strategies to support nurse practitioners um, that are applying to 103. Um, there, it can be a challenge. Um, but please let us know, members, non-members, please let us know so we can help and guide you. Um, the third thing is um, build your professional portfolio. Um, CANP has put together um, a professional portfolio that helps walk you through not only as a new nurse practitioner in California, but also those planning to apply to be a 103 and those that have accomplished to be a 103 and moving forward to a 104. Um, we have um, created this step-by-step -step guide um, so that you can keep track of everything as well as any possible retroactive review um, if there was any questions to um, attestation, um, as well as for those people that you're working with, maybe they would like to see, you know, what your transition to practice consists of. Um, so please keep that uh, in mind that we have access um, for, um, for you to um, help support you in 103 and 104. Um, movements. And then most importantly, please register for our conference in 2025. Um, it will be just as exciting as last year's. It's in Rancho Mirage, as Amy has highlighted. And this is where you're going to get some upfront information about the doctor title that we slightly um, spoke about. Um, but you are going to hear straight from the organization that is um supporting the doctor title. So um, please sign up because I know those uh, that event is going to go fast in regards to seating. Next slide. Thank you, Cynthia. So now we're going to turn to the portion of the webinar where we address the remaining questions that were not already covered by the previously presented content. So question number one that I will present to the panel, is there a shorter pathway for independent practice for nurse practitioners with greater than 10 years of experience? Hi, Amy, I'll go ahead and answer this one. Um, if the NP has 4,600 hours of direct care experience in the previous five years or has three years full-time equivalent years of work within the previous five years, then the NP can apply for the 103 NP certificate through the BRN. Thank you, Cynthia. So question number two, when can I apply for 103 NP certificate status as a GNP with 17 plus years of experience? Uh, thanks, Amy. Well, as Garrett, as Garrett um, mentioned, you can apply January 1st, 2025. This is what we worked so hard for, especially for our well-experienced um, nurse practitioners, especially our GNPs. So January 1st, mark your calendars. Thank you for that. Question number three. So if my nurse practitioner program is already recognized by the BRN, with the full implementation of the bill, will I still be required to obtain certification from AACN, ANCC, Pediatric Nursing Certification Board, National Certification Corporation, or the American Association of Nurse Practitioners? Um, Amy, great question. Um, if the NP wants wants to apply for the 103 or 104 status, then the NP must have a national certification from AACN, ANCC, AANP, the PNCB, or NCC, even if the NP program is recognized by the BRN. The California BRN NP recognition does not require national certification. And thank you, Cynthia, I totally agree. Um, if you don't have national certification, as I mentioned earlier, um, then you revert back to a standardized procedure NP. But there's no requirement in California to be nationally certified. So um, I totally agree with your, your answer, Cynthia. Thank you. 
Thank you both. So the last question that wasn't already addressed by the presented content from our panel is my supervising physician can't seem to find the email from the BRN verifying my 18 years accumulation of hours that I've worked for with her. Can I get a notarized signature from her that I can submit instead? Wow, great question. So the physician needs to contact the BRN for help in getting this resolved. The only way that an attestation can be given is through the BRN Breeze portal. Um, this goes directly to the physician in order to attest. So please encourage them to, um, to reach out to the BRN. Thank you. So if you're a member of CANP, you can present additional questions through our Ask a Practice question anytime. You can either scan the QR code here or you can go to the CANP website and use the traditional link to submit your question. For those of you that are not members, you can still pose your questions by emailing CANP. So you can email them at admin at canpweb.org or you can scan this QR code and that will direct your question to our experts. And finally, before we close, remember that you can go onto the CMP website and take advantage of the $25 discount by using the NP join code. And this will be available until October 31st. And I wanna thank our panelists for participating today and all of the nurse practitioners that took time to send questions for us to address. And of course, for all of your time joining the webinar tonight, we'll be sending out this recording shortly and I encourage you to send it to your NP colleagues. Thank you again and have a great evening.